Okay. Are you out of here? Um, yeah, in a minute. Okay. Hey, Claudia? Yeah. Don't tell anybody, but I sure think you're awesome. <laughs> no, I wouldn't tell anybody. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, and Double Dog, don't tell anybody. All right. I think you're pretty awesome, too. I certainly will not share that. Well, if you did, I'd deny it. All right, done. <laughs> One of the things that I think is often lost in the translation of sobriety is what I have to work so hard at being able to achieve and maintain that stasis, that peace of mind. It seems that normal people that are not alcoholic as they go through life, the rough edges that, that need to be worn out oftentimes get worn down on them without having to do any work. People just seem to naturally know that, you know what, if I just show up and be a decent human being and try to be of support to my community, to my church, to my school, to my employer, to my family, that everything's going to be okay. They just innately have that, whether it's derived from their religious practice, whether it's derived from, you know, their secure upbringing, you know. For some reason, I was unable to, to really uh, assimilate that into my life. And when I realized how badly I'd come off of the, the, the rails, how badly I would mismanaged my life and how painful the atmosphere I'd created for myself was, you know, I had to take a long, hard look at how I was showing up and make some pretty drastic changes. And at the time, that seemed like it was a death sentence. It seemed like my life was over. I was never going to have any fun. I was never going to be able to participate in anything that had any value. And the opposite is true. So we'll start with, what is your name? My name is Lowell McGregor. I'm a recovering alcoholic. My sobriety date is 12 10 89, And I'm also the purveyor and executive director of the TaylorMade Retreat out in Beaverton, Oregon. What is addiction? Addiction is an unhealthy uh, attachment to a substance or activity that causes problems in a person's life. It may be alcohol, it may be drugs, it may be sex, it may be gambling, it may be food, anything that becomes problematic. And when the problem becomes greater than the uh, resolution that it offers, we have to address that problem. Yeah, Lowell, so let's, uh, let's get into your story. My sobriety dates 12, 10, 89. Preceding that was a whole small lifetime of malfeasance. I started out being really challenged. I was kicked out of preschool for bringing a kid in the sandbox. I was kicked out of kindergarten for finger painting on a kid's shirt. Uh, I was, it was an endless march to and from the principal's office trying to deal with my behavioral problems. I was diagnosed with ADD and HD and I was offered, my parents were offered Ritalin as a solution to that, but they didn't take them up on it. My behavioral problems continued well through my, my elementary school years into my junior high school years. I moved to New Jersey when I was 10 and uh, started getting involved with people that, that were, uh, of a different uh, upbringing than mine. I gravitated towards people that had criminal intent and who were violently antisocial. By the time we moved back from New Jersey to the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, uh, we moved into a house two exits down from where I live now. And I began consuming alcohol and drugs. I drank when I was 10 and gotten into some trouble. I didn't really start drinking heavily until I was 13. And when I say drinking, that, that consumption of alcohol also entailed the consumption of marijuana. Marijuana was easier to get because you didn't have to have ID to get it. I would shoulder tap beer. I would do whatever was necessary. I used to shoplift beer and fortified wine so I could get drunk. We had friends, siblings that had boyfriends that were old enough to get alcohol, so they'd pick it up for us. At the very least, I became a weekend alcoholic. By the time I was 14, I was convicted of multiple felonies. Uh, my alcoholism led me to a place where I had actually mounted an armed robbery and had in a variety of criminal behaviors that, that landed me in trouble. While I was locked up in juvenile hall, I smarted off to a full grown man who was guarding us. And he came into my cell and, and uh, didn't really explain to me, but demonstrated for me how incapable I was as a, 
a young child, a 14 year old boy to defend myself against a man. He put the fear of God into me. I didn't want to recreate that situation because I knew it was going to get nothing but worse. I cleaned up my act. I did some youth contact, uh, youth therapy when group therapy, when I was to 15, but I never stopped the consumption of my substances of choice. Although I did learn how to communicate better. I did learn how to present my case better. I never really did anything to address the underlying causes and conditions. And I continued to, to, uh, medicate or allow myself to be oblivious to what was going on as a result of consuming all kinds of substances. It went from alcohol and pot to cocaine, to heroin, to just anything under the sun. My drug of choice, I like to say was more, whatever was available. I wanted more of it. And as a result, uh, I spiraled out of control. I attempted suicide multiple times. I ended up in the psych ward of a hospital after being tied down in five point restraint and having my stomach punked with liquid charcoal. It just got to the point where being me was too painful. My life was crumbling between my ears. Uh, I really could not break free of the mental obsession, not just about drinking and using, but about suicide and about all the things that have transpired in my life. And the only way I could get relief was through the consumption of alcohol and drugs. Cocaine was really the catalyst for, for change in my life. My life had hit a crescendo. I was traveling with bands all over the world. I'd been in Japan three times the last year of my drinking and using. I had uh, what I considered to be a successful, uh, I was at a successful point in my career. The alcohol and the drugs were no longer taking away the discomfort. In fact, they were compounding it. So as a result, I had to do something to address that or I was gonna end up dead. One of those suicide attempts was gonna be a, a fatality. I did go to treatment uh, after 30 days. They asked me to participate in their program. I admitted that I was alcoholic. I admitted that my drug use, I got clean about all the things that were going on in my life until they started asking me to do what they wanted me to do. And I refused. I did not want to write in a notebook, but after several frustrating rounds of interaction, my treatment center counselor stood up in front of the rest of the, the group and said, people like you never get sober. You might as well not even bother trying. Now there's probably going to be a gasp or two when you hear that, but the reality is that was my situation. I had to be indifferent to what I was doing to other people in order to continue the way I was living. And, uh, I, I really didn't know how to change. I didn't know I needed to change. I didn't realize that I had become disconnected from my life and disconnected from other people and disconnected for, from what I call God, my higher power. When I came into the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the first meeting that I attended was at a young people's fellowship hall. And there was a man named Taylor Haynes who was sitting in the back of the room and the chairperson as Taylor was standing up to go to the bathroom called on him. And I don't remember what he said other than Taylor said, Taylor's going to the bathroom right now. And when I come back, if you'd like me to share, I will. And I just, there was a, a sense of ease and comfort. He was comfortable in his own skin in a way that I couldn't relate to. And as a result, I went up to him after the meeting and I asked him to be my sponsor. He immediately took a look at me and said, uh, yeah, no, not interested in that position. And uh, I think he could see what the treatment center had seen that I was a poly drug user from an early age displaying sociopathic tendencies. He was a busy guy. He was 23 or 24 years sober. When I met him, he ran his own business. He, he didn't really have time or desire to take on some new guy that was fresh out of treatment, but he did allow me to come to his house. He said, come to my house on Wednesday at five. I went to his house Wednesday at five. I was even there early. I knocked on the door. He said, well, you made it come on in, but don't talk to my wife and don't touch anything. And I might add that he had a daughter that he didn't even mention for a couple of years. He took me in the back room and he told me not what I was or what I wasn't going to be able to do. He told me I was not only going to be able to recover, but I was going to have a message that would have depth and weight that I might be able to use that to impact other people's lives. He pulled me off of the scrap heap of life. He dusted me off and gave me a new perspective. And he was up until he died you know, the go-to guy that provided me with, with that connection when I lost it, uh, that man impacted not only my life, but everybody who is involved in my life, everybody from the point that I met him forward, he has a lasting reverberation in every interaction I have in my life. And, uh, I wouldn't have the life that I have today if it weren't for him. 
I owe that man a debt of gratitude that I can never repay. And he was simply an agent for Alcoholics Anonymous. He simply provided me access to the information that was in the book. I needed to have him steward me through that. And uh, he stood by my side all the way up until he died. Over the course of our relationship, the only thing he ever asked me to do was to give back the time that he'd given to me, which is why TaylorMade exists today. And uh, that man, I hope we can do enough here that uh, his memory will last. I've now been sober for 33 years. And my greatest passion ever has been the transmission of this message to other people that suffer from the things that I suffer. The people that I relate the most to are the people that are in the worst shape, the people that are, are constantly plagued by thoughts of suicide, who are unable to really assimilate into society, who without alcohol and drugs don't know how to cope. And that passion has led me to uh, working with alcoholics and addicts of all ilks for the last 33 years. Now, the freedom that I was given as a result of the application of these steps in my life allowed me to have a completely different career. I left the music industry. I started working as a laborer, putting lumber into a saw. I parlayed that job into another couple of jobs at that same warehouse and then went to another warehouse, but I was still dabbling a little bit with the music industry, did some jazz shows during the summer, rebuilt an outdoor concert venue called the Chateau Saint-Michel up in Seattle, Washington. And uh, one thing led to another and all of a sudden doors just started opening. It wasn't because I had a five-year plan. It wasn't because I went back to school and got a degree in, in venue management. I just started doing what I'd, I'd been set out to do. I was unfettered by the beliefs that I had about myself and was able to, to harness a new source of energy and new source of power that allowed me to, to not only uh, participate, but proliferate in life. As a result, I went from pushing lumber into a saw, working in a cabinet shop to a executive producer as a event producer, producing political rallies for Ralph Nader all over the country touring with Pearl Jam as a tour accountant, being the executive producer for Tony Hawk's Boom Boom Huck Jam, having professional success that was unimaginable to a guy like me. And uh, all of that came as a result of doing the work that I did in Alcoholics Anonymous, having that new relationship with myself and with that, that higher power. And uh, I found a romantic interest in a childhood friend. I had a child in that that marriage, I've been able to buy houses, sell houses, take action that, that would imply that I was actually an adult with some level of responsibility in my life. Things that were just not conceivable when I got sober. About five years ago, I made a decision that I wanted to do more in terms of the sharing of this message, the transmission of, of the 12 steps. I made a commitment to try and, and pursue an avenue that would make me more effective and allow me to touch more people. As a result, I ended up, long story short, making a commitment to opening up a 12-step immersion program called the TaylorMade Retreat, uh, Retreat up in Beaverton, Oregon. The last five years have led me to not only make a commitment, but take the actions necessary to bring this concept to fruition. And over the course of this time, help literally hundreds of people and many fold call it four to seven times that number of people that are, are being touched by the lives of the, the alcoholic or the addict, the sufferer of the addiction. It's been a real honor. I'm humbled by the fact that I'm given this, this opportunity. I just, I look forward to many more years of doing the same stuff. If you have one big tip that can help somebody who is struggling, what would that tip be? Probably the biggest struggle that I have on a daily basis. The big, biggest struggle I have in trying to get people exposed to recovery is surrendering, acknowledging that I'm struggling to try and force something to happen that, that can't happen or is not gonna produce the outcomes that I want and stop that struggle and surrender. You know, I think that our egos tell us that we can figure this out, we can do it. And just the willingness to admit that, you know what? I don't have this figured out. I don't know what's supposed to happen here. I do know that when I surrender and allow things to unfold the way they're supposed to, things happen in a beautiful fashion. And it's just a matter of me being willing to let that go. It doesn't matter how much time I have in sobriety. That's still the challenge that I have to surmount on a daily basis.
And the truth is when I'm able to surrender the joy of just being surprised, pleasantly surprised by what li unfolds in life, uh, that outweighs anything I've ever been able to receive as a result of trying to, to manifest what I want. You know, either it's the consumption of my substance of choice, or it's finding the right job or finding the right uh, number of zeros for my net worth. Any of that stuff is hollow by comparison with uh, the real benefit that can be derived as a result of surrendering. The question I think a lot of people ask is, am I able to maybe try it again? Am I able to consume my substance of, of choice with impunity? And the answer for me is absolutely not. In fact, I know to my core that the consumption of alcohol, cocaine, heroin, whatever it is, is not going to offer me any kind of respite. When I allow myself to buy back into the belief that I can control outcomes, when I start trying to force things to happen, when I make decisions based on self that put me in a position to be hurt, I end up skipping right over alcohol and drugs and uh, leaning into the idea that maybe I need to end my life. That's what I would, that's where I was at when I got here at 15 years of sobriety without the consumption of any substances whatsoever. I came close to taking my own life because I was trying to run the show. I was trying to manage all these things. I was trying to manage all these facets of life that I had no business trying to control the outcomes of. And the pressure was too great. You know, when I surrender and I just allow what's supposed to happen to take place, it all works out beautifully. I just have to keep that in mind. If you're looking at your addiction, at your alcoholism, at your current circumstances as the end of the road, if you make that decision to surrender and do this work, that'll be the beginning of your life. I did not come to a termination point when I stopped drinking and using. I opened up a whole vista of life and existence that I didn't even know was remotely possible. The depth of feelings that I have, the intimacy that I have with close friends, and I have all kinds of friends from all kinds of walks of life. You know, all those things were impossible for me when I got sober, yet all of those things are readily available to me today. For anybody that's considering whether or not they should make the decision to try and get sober, if you could even for a moment catch a glimpse of what's in my heart, what I've got in my mind, what I get to experience on a daily basis, if I could, if I could do a Vulcan mind meld and, and pass that along to you, I would do it because the potential for an amazing life, uh, I can't guarantee what's going to happen. I can't guarantee what you're going to earn. I can't guarantee where you're going to live. But what Taylor told me was, if I practice these principles on all of my affairs, I could live anywhere I wanted to live. I could do anything I wanted to do. I could define who I was going to be as a person. And nothing has held more true than that. And that's my wish for everybody that suffers from addiction and alcoholism. Find that pathway. You know, come along and join us. There's a whole life out there that you can't even envision. What is sobriety? What is sobriety? Sobriety to me is having a peace of mind, having the ability to participate in life and be comfortable in my own skin. Sobriety is not the cessation of my substance of choice. It's the ability to achieve a stasis, a, uh, a place in this world where I'm okay, regardless of what happens on the outside. You know, for so much of my life, the first half of my life, I was buffeted around by other people's opinions, by other people's actions. If I didn't get what I wanted out of situations, I would respond poorly. And when that didn't work, I would drink at those situations. Sobriety is me finding the ability to maintain a connection to humanity, to maintain a connection to that God that is at the core of who I am, being able to live in an existence where I don't have to be in conflict. I can just be okay being who I am. I can learn how to love people, accept people for who they are, and participate on a level of, of intimacy and, and compassion and a genuine desire to be of service to other people. And when I'm at that place, I, there's nothing that can compare with that. When I'm there and I'm, I'm on the beam, Nothing can shake that. Nothing can make me feel any way. And that I think was what I was looking for when I was consuming all these substances was just some way to feel like I was okay and I could never do it.
Thank you so much, man. That is beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, not to, not to stroke your ego or anything. I don't right. want to do that. Don't let me do that. But yeah, that's great. Thank you, man. It's a powerful message. Don't worry. If you stroke my ego, God will knock it back down. Hi, I'm Kenny Hill with Recovery Hill. My intention here is to show the diversity of sobriety. How one finds themselves clawing from bottom is as nuanced as their journey to bottom. And their situation and recovery has the potential to be highly relatable to somebody who is watching. Therefore, I offer the interviewees to have total freedom to express whatever has worked for them, whatever has helped them sustain sobriety. That said, here at the end of the interview, I want to make a quick request so that it wasn't to take away from the interview itself. This request is that you like and share the video. You can subscribe if you want, that's up to you, but at least like and share it so that the content can get to as many people as possible. There is a great capacity and potential for the story you just watched to be able to help out somebody else to begin their story of recovery.